Hello, and welcome back to The Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey. Uh, today, I was going over some games from uh, the Tata Steel Masters tournament that is going on right now. And there were a few that, that caught my eye uh, when I was trying to think of a theme for, for tonight's class. And so that theme I wanted to talk about is hooks in chess. Does anybody know what a hook is off the top of their head? No? Nobody knows what a hook is. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll see some very concrete examples of what a hook is and, and how to really use it to your advantage here uh, in tonight's class. Um, basically, what it is is when the pawns are on the seventh rank, it's hard to, to get at them. This is just obviously nonsense. But you can see whenever a pawn reaches a square, where it can attack another pawn, and laptop struggling, uh, you often try to do this to, to open files later in the game, to launch an attack. But when the pawns are all in the seventh rank, they can quite often just step forward, kind of like dodging, dodging the pawn and keeping the files closed. And so what a hook is, is when a player commits to moving a pawn off of the seventh rank, for example, with a move like g6, now after h5, g5 is a lot less easy to play than the move g6, because you're stepping away from your other pawn's protection. So quite often, players will use uh, any pawns that move forward as a hook, something to grab onto to open up files. And so we're going to see how that actually looks in, in practical games and how, in this case, Fabiano Caruana used it to his advantage against Alireza Ferrugia. So without further ado, let's see the game. It started off in the king's Indian defense with knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6, and h3. So h3 is kind of a sideline for, for white, but it's, it's a pretty ambitious one. The idea is, quite often in the king's Indian, uh, black castles uh, kingside and tries to push through with this move f5 to gain some kingside space. And h3 is very early on taking control of the g4 square and hinting at the fact that white might want to play g4 himself, uh, taking away this f5 option, or at least making it a little more difficult. That being said, black still gets castled. White plays bishop e3. And black has tried a few things here. Uh, e5 and c5 are both pretty common uh, lines here for black. But uh, Ferrugia chose a little bit of a sideline. He chose knight c6. And this is really committing to, uh, to the small center idea, where this move is daring white to take all of the central space in the hopes that later on, Ferrugia is going to be able to attack the center. It's going to be a little overextended. And you really see this with the, the next couple moves that happen. Uh, knight c6 is begging for d5 to be played, uh, kicking this knight away from its natural home on c6. Uh, and Fabi does not shy away from it. d5 is played. Now this knight steps into e5, which doesn't look like a bad square at all. It attacks the c4 pawn. It looks at this uh, d3 square. But of course, again, it's begging to be kicked away by this move f4, which Fabi uh, also does not shy away from. And now after knight e d7, Fabi fully commits to this idea and plays g4 to continue. So you see in this opening here, black has moved this knight around uh, just a bit, wasted some time. Uh, in return for this, white has a massive center and some space on the king's side as well. And now the battle is going to be, can Ferrugia try to prove that these pawns and squares are going to be a little bit weak? Or will Fabi use this space to, uh, to get, get an advantage? Uh, of course, with a center this uh, imposing, you can't let it sit for just too, for too long. So Ferrugia immediately plays c6, already starting to chip away at this center. Fabi continues development with knight f3. We see c takes d5 and c takes d5. Now this bishop is still undeveloped, so black continues with b6. We have knight d4, aiming at this new weakness that has just been created. And now knight c5. And you can start to see how Ferrugia's play is, is coming together here. Um, both of these knights are aimed at this e4 pawn. And a common way to defend it in the King's Indian would be, uh, would be to play a move like f3. Obviously, the f pawn has been advanced. And this is what we mean when we say squares have been weakened by uh, Fabi grabbing so much space. So because the f pawn can't defend e4 anymore, Fabi simply brings the queen out to do this job instead. 
This bishop comes out to the b7 square, getting off the back rank, clearing the way for a rook to come to the c-file. We see g5. And now there is actually a little bit of uh, a tactic here that is played. Rather than retreat this knight, uh, Ferruja realizes he needs to do something about this center. And so he actually captures on e4. And after knight takes e4, uh, the point of the tactic is bishop takes d5, pinning the knight to uh, the, the major pieces for, uh, for white here. However, of course, it's not quite so simple. Uh, what seems like the move for, uh, for white to, to get out of this pin? What resource does, does white actually have here? There's really only one one way to play here. <clears throat> so just to go back to the basics of pins, this knight can't move because the bishop will capture the queen. But if you move this knight and create a threat of greater value than the queen, then the bishop does not have time to capture. So how can we create a threat of greater value by moving this knight? Yeah. Knight f6 check is, is exactly right. The bishop can't capture the queen because it breaks the laws of chess, and Ferruja follows the laws of chess. So he captures this knight. And now uh, white can actually capture on d5. And for the moment, Fabi is up a full piece, just one full piece. But Bruges is going to get some, some pretty nasty compensation for it. So we see first rook e8 hits this bishop on e3. So Fabi plays knight c2. F takes g5, queenside castles, and now g takes f4. And uh, this is quite a, quite a lot of pawns that uh, Ferruja has gotten for the piece here. And so he has some compensation. And I wanted to talk about um, the way Ferruja actually has played thus far, because it's actually been a, a pretty well-played game up to this point. Uh, when you play an opening like the one that Ferruja did, where you see pawns on d5, e4, g4, and, and f4, uh, you can't really play nonchalantly, or else eventually you will get kind of rolled over. So Ferruja recognized this, and he played this peace sacrifice, which many, many players would, would shy away from. But it really is necessary uh, when you play an opening like this. If you can't find a way to break down the center, you really are just going to get rolled over by the space. The pawns are going to continue pushing. Uh, the white pieces are going to be more active. And so you do have to play kind of crazy lines like this uh, when, when the position calls for it. Uh, with that in mind, though, the game continued. Bishop d4. Bishop takes d4. Queen takes d4. This knight comes to e6. Now, uh, white could capture this pawn if he wanted, but sometimes it's better to keep some pieces on, especially in, uh, in this position, I think. The queens kind of favor white, because white's going to try to launch an attack on this king's side eventually. We see queen d2. This queen comes to f6. Fabi takes the time to play king b1, simply improving his king's position. Now rook a c8, bishop b5, finally developing this bishop and gaining some time on this rook. Rook e d8 knight b4, and now d5. And once again, Ferruja is, is playing quite well. He, he's keeping pace with Fabi in a wildly imbalanced position. Um, so a little uh, side note on, uh, on playing down a piece when you have a lot of pawns for compensation. This is, exact, this is exactly what you want to do. Uh, it's not enough to simply hold on to the pawns and claim that they're enough compensation for the piece. Here, uh, Ferruja actually has four pawns for the piece. But those pawns only really count if they start moving down the board. And so that's what he's doing here with this d pawn. He's starting to move it down the board. Once again, Fabi could capture this pawn. But then the files start to open up for the black rooks. This queen is a little bit awkwardly placed. And uh, the activity that black would get in, in, a, in return for it really isn't worth it here. So he's just making his d pawn, uh, his d pawn's presence felt with this move d5. And then eventually, we'll see after rook f1 and rook c5, and a4, now d4 as well. The, the further up the board this pawn gets, uh, the more its, its presence is kind of felt. It's, a, it's actually like a, a player in the game. It's not just like currency. 
you see players sometimes talk about pawns like their currency, like, oh, uh, white is, is up uh, plus one here. That's like one pawn. And then he pays his, his pawn away for a different advantage. Uh, that's not really how, how playing with extra pawns works. Th they're pieces, and they should kind of be used as such. In this case, it's controlling some key squares and threatening to, to get even further down the board, getting closer, closer to queening. Uh, knight d3 is white's choice, blockading this pawn on d4. We see rook f5, rook f3, and so Fabi blockades all of black's pawns. Uh, and now g5, and I want to talk about this move a little bit. So I was just talking about how pawns needed to be pushed down the board to make their presence felt, but especially with the pawns in front of the king, that's when you have to be a little bit careful. So you might remember what I was talking about at the beginning of this lecture, which was hooks. And g5 is definitely creating a hook. So how can Fabi look to take advantage of this? Uh, not immediately, but uh, maybe a little bit later down the line. What move in particular should Fabi be looking at now? And yeah, really both players. Yeah, that's totally right. h4 is always going to be something for uh, Ferruja to look out for and for Fabi to try to take advantage of. Um, h4, trying to open up uh, files in front of this black king to make his extra piece uh, be, be useful. You know, conversely, you know, we talked about using the pawns, getting them up the board so their presence is known. With the extra piece, uh, it's sometimes quite useful to launch an attack on the king's side. Uh, try to get at the king, because that's where the pieces really shine, is when uh, lines open up and you have something to, to really attack. So what's the problem with h4 immediately? What would black play? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's not a very good hook if uh, black can simply step out of the way. Now this g file stays closed, and in fact these pawns in tandem together are going to be very, very strong. So h4 would actually be a huge mistake immediately. But with that in mind, what might be a better move to start creating some threats of playing h4? Yeah, queen g2 or rook g1. These, these are both great moves. Um, in the game, Fabi chose rook g1, and I think I like this one a little bit better than queen g2. But yeah, queen g2 is, is a great idea as well. I think it's, it's a perfectly good move. But we'll stick with rook g1. And now, uh, Fabi's threat is, is kind of obvious with this knowledge in mind, right? So Fabi wants to play h4. What do you think the best way for black to respond to this threat is? What can, uh, what can black do? So ideally, black would want to keep the files closed somehow. In the previous position, he did that by playing g4. And so is there any way we can kind of renew this threat or, or this uh, re resource of playing g4? Any ideas? So I'll give you a little hint. It'd help if we had some piece that was able to control this square, right? So can we defend this square in preparation for the move h4? Yeah, h5 is exactly right. Um, and once again, this comes back to making the presence of your pawns kind of, kind of known. You're using this pawn not as currency, not as something to say, I have one pawn, this is good. This is one of my four pawns for the piece, that means I'm doing OK. You're using it a as a useful, useful defender. And so now h4 would once again be a terrible mistake, because g4 would come with, with a lot of force. And this pawn might even get, get captured. Um, and really, this, this was Ferruja's one and only serious mistake in this game. Uh, up until this point, he had been playing very, very well. And, but unfortunately for him, Fabi had also been playing very, very well. Um, and it just so happened that Ferruja made the first mistake. He played the move uh, king f8. And now after h4, uh, Fabi's hook is, is kind of successful. Uh, it would be a huge mistake now to, to take on h4, because this open g file would be very, very, very problematic for, uh, 
for black, as well as the fact that you've removed the defender of this f pawn is going to be a big deal as well. In fact, simply rook g4 might immediately be picking up this pawn. And then these remaining pawns, while there are a lot of them, they're, they're not exactly uh, the most stable. They should be able to, to be picked up by the remaining white pieces. So instead of trying to capture this pawn, uh, black plays h6, but the hook is here. Fabi still has a chance to open the file, and he does so immediately with h takes g5 and h takes g5. And this is the, the, the power of a hook in chess and latching onto the hook is in this position, the white major pieces have no way of getting into the king's side. And compared to this position, there's now this avenue to, uh, to invade the black camp. And Fabi immediately tries to take advantage of it with this move, rook h3. And so now you can imagine the white pieces starting to get at this, uh, get at this black king if black isn't careful. Uh, Ferusian continued with f3, trying to push this pawn further, uh, trying to make this pawn more relevant than the threats on the king's side. Uh, Fabi actually continues with bishop c4, eyeing now this knight, which was defending this, this g pawn. Note, without the pawn on h7, h6 now is not an available uh, move to defend this pawn, so this is a little bit more of a weakness. King e7, Ferusian tries to escape from the king's side, we see bishop takes e6, and now actually king takes e6. And here maybe Frugia missed his chance. Maybe uh, f2 was a little bit of a better move to try and uh, uncoordinate the white pieces before recapturing this bishop. But OK, we see king takes e6. And now after queen h2, this queen is eyeing some very important squares around this king, as well as uh, confirming Fabi's control over this uh, open file here. And the, the end is really near for Ferruja. Uh, the game did continue with f2, rook f1, king d7. This rook comes into h6 now. And you see this open file is really what, what uh, sealed Ferruja's fate. Queen e7, this rook captures f2. And now that uh, Ferruja's extra pawns are starting to fall, the extra knight is as well worth it. King c8, a5, and Kind of similarly to the king's side, we see uh, Fabi using yet another hook to uh, break down this defensive structure. In this case, though, Ferruja does capture. And now we see queen c2 check, king b8, knight c5. And with this pawn removed, uh, knight c5 is now coming in with, with pretty strong effect. Rook d6, we see rook h8 check, rook d8, queen b3 check, king c7. And with this knight now in tandem with the queen, the king comes to d6. And after rook h6, uh, f6, and knight e4, uh, Ferruja felt it was time to resign this game. Uh, the king is, is just going to get trapped. And uh, after a move like king e6, there's simply rook f6. And there's no way to stay in contact with this queen. And this end game is, is pretty, much, pretty much hopeless. And, and so that was uh, the, the end of the game for Ferruja. And I don't want to downplay how well Ferruja was playing up until this point. Um, this sacrifice on, on e4 was actually uh, quite nice for Ferruja. Getting all these pawns in return for this, this knight, blowing up the white center, uh, was all very, very good, good ideas. But then the fact is, um, Fabi played with a, a lot of precision, precision in this game. And while Ferruja was making his, his pawns useful, this move g5 is kind of the start uh, of things starting to tip in Fabi's favor. And then after king f8, this is when h4 uh, really opened up the position in Fabi's favor. And he converted uh, kind of flawlessly. So once again, always be aware of these hooks that you create and how your opponent can take advantage of them. So definitely h5 was the way Ferruja should have played here. Getting ready to counter the move h4 with the move g4 when uh, everything would be looking quite well for, uh, for black. Uh, any questions on this game? Um, I kind of went through a, a lot of the, the opening up till move like 20 or so pretty quickly. But uh, the, the main point I wanted to talk about was, was this g5 and, and h4 kind of maneuver. But uh, any, any questions about anything that, that happened there? What was Perugia's goal with g5? So, 
so yeah, Fabio wasn't really threatening to, to capture f4, but, but maybe after move rook f1, he, he would be. g5 itself, I don't think, is, is actually a bad move. Uh, after rook g1 and h5, you can imagine somewhere down the road uh, with some more uh, preparatory moves. Let's, let's say uh, Fabi wastes some time here. Not that he would. I'm not even sure these are good moves. But let's say this rook gets to g8 somehow, right? And then all of a sudden, the move g4 starts to look a lot more appealing. Um, after takes, takes, with these two pawns together, this is actually like a winning attempt for black. Uh, I gave black a lot of time there, and obviously that, that wouldn't happen uh, in this manner in the game. But with the move h5 and g4, uh, Ferugia would be really creating some serious threats on the king's side. So g5 is nice in the fact that it's, it's kind of playing for a win, but it does come with some risks, which is important to keep in mind. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I think Black could play h5 here if he wanted, but um, it it doesn't make as much sense uh, w without g5 um, because I mean what what you're doing is controlling g4 and and that really isn't necessary unless h4 is is coming on the board, but uh, probably Fabi would would play a move like. Maybe still rook g1, maybe this move bishop c4 that he played in the game w would also be his, his response. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure the order was super important, but, but g5 first kind of makes sense. You want to defend this pawn, and you want to start to create some threats of expanding further. Uh, okay, anything else before I move on? All right. Now I want to take a look at, we see, we've seen the, the number two in the world use hooks to his advantage in this tournament. Let's see uh, what the number one in the world can do, Magnus Carlsen. Uh, this was his game against uh, Vladislav Kovalev, uh, also from the Tata Steel Masters, I believe also in, in round 10. Uh, but let's see how this game went. We have d4 once again, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, d5, knight c3, bishop e7. Uh, so just a, a qgd, queen's gambit declines, bishop g5, castles, e3, h6, bishop f4, and now c5. And uh, in this type of position, with so much tension in the center, uh, sometimes both players let it sit for a while, but almost always someone caves and starts capturing these pawns. In this case, white does it immediately with d takes c5. We see bishop takes c5, and now a3. And uh, We'll, we'll see white's idea here in just a couple moves. We see knight c6, queen c2, and now knight h5 is black's uh, opening choice here. Bishop comes to g3. And now, if black wastes any more time, I think uh, white's idea is to play this move b4 and gain a lot of space here on the queen side with moves like b4 and c5, as well as ideas of, of taking on d5 as well. So because of some of this, uh, black simply captures on, D, on c4 here as well. Uh, bishop takes, this bishop comes back to e7, stepping out of b4, stepping out of the, the queen's line of sight. This bishop actually drops back to a2. We see a6, rook d1 hitting the queen, queen a5, and now uh, a very annoying move by Magnus, uh, bishop b1. So this was his idea with bringing the bishop back to a2. So he wanted to reroute behind this queen and really make some threats of giving checkmate. So off the top of your head, how would you respond to this with black? You have a few options. Yeah, g6 is a very, very natural move. It's, it's the most natural move to, to kind of stop this uh, threat. And I'm not totally sure what made uh, Kovalev shy away from this move. Maybe it was simply he was feeling a little bit more ambitious than g6. Obviously, this move comes with some weaknesses. It weakens the f6 square and the h6 square. But perhaps this bishop uh, could snuggle itself in nicely on, uh, on g7. Probably part of the issue for Kovalev is that he wanted to, I'll just play a random move here. He probably wanted to capture this bishop. And he might have been a little bit wary of leaving this h-pawn behind with the opening of the h-file coming, coming in soon. Uh, because of that, he played the move f5. But actually, g6 was, was simply better. This is keeping things a little bit more compact and not giving white such a powerful hook, which we'll see later in the game. 
So after f5, uh, with the theme of the lecture being hooks, how can we take advantage of this move at a later date, not immediately? Which move? E4. Yeah, actually e4. And we'll see another way to take advantage of it later in the game, too, which is g4, g4 exactly, uh, which could be either this h pawn coming to g4 or our initial g pawn. And this is actually exactly what, what Magnus does. He, he just uses this pawn to his advantage and, and breaks open the, the center uh, with pretty devastating effect. Hi, right, welcome. So uh, the game continued. Uh, white went ahead and got castled. Black now captures this bishop. We see h takes, bishop f6, and then uh, Magnus actually doesn't waste any time here. He breaks open the position with either g4 or e4. Which one do you think it was here? Any guesses? E4 was his choice. Can I ask why you liked E4 over G4? I wanted more protection on the king side, and I wanted to break up the middle. So yeah, that's, that uh, that, that's pretty fair. Yeah, E4 simply opens up. Uh, so both moves are aimed at opening up the diagonal. Uh, we can say that. As well as opening up this E4 square, if black were to capture. But the move e4 also kind of opens up this, this e file as well. And this is something that uh, Magnus probably wanted to, to use to his advantages as well. You can imagine, let's say if we took like this, you see this e pawn is still kind of in the way. It, it keeps, keeps things kind of boxed out for, uh, for Magnus. So e4 was actually his choice. Uh, I thought you might be tempted to say g4, because you're fixing your pawn structure. Uh, obviously, black really shouldn't take. And so there might be uh, a captures. And now your pawn structure looks a little bit better. But in fact, I think it's e4 that is, that is actually better. And that's something to keep in mind in your games uh, in many types of positions. Just because a pawn is doubled doesn't make it necessarily worse than, than another pawn. And so this g pawn here is actually quite useful. Uh, it is blocking any ideas along this diagonal. And it has a lot of mobility to come to g4. Whereas this pawn on the e3 square is, is kind of in the way. So e4 was Magnus's choice. We see bishop takes c3. Uh, of course, white wants to keep queens on the board, so he recaptures with the pawn. And now after queen takes a3, uh, white continues with this plan and takes on f5, opening up the diagonal a little bit more. Uh, now Magnus wants to use this e file to his advantage, like we said, so he plays rook fe1. And this is something uh, that I really like from, from Magnus here. Uh, perhaps a less patient player would have just played g4 immediately, but there's just really no reason to rush. He simply improves all of his, pe all of his pieces, and then uh, only then continues with the plan. So rook e1, this queen comes back to a5. And now I, I've kind of given it away, but, but what do you expect the next move to be here? Exactly, g4. And so we kind of see a, a double hook on this uh, f5 square. Uh, Magnus uses this advanced pawn. He hooks onto it and uses it to open up diagonals and files for all of his pieces. And that's how he gains activity in what used to be a closed position. So g4 is his move. And Magnus is actually completely crushing in this position. Uh, black tried queen c7. Of course, you don't want to take this. Queen h7 is devastating. So queen c7, knight h4. He puts even more pressure onto this pawn, uh, ready to open things up. g5 is Kovalev's attempt, but after knight takes f5, uh, Magnus is simply winning a pawn, and it's going to be very, very difficult for uh, black to deal with this f5 pawn. Of course, you can't let this knight just sit here. It will move out of the way to numerous squares and allow the pieces in. So uh, Kovalev desperately tries to keep the position closed by taking this knight and blockading this pawn, trying to use white's pawn against him. But of course, this is not quite as solid as having you know, a member of your own army on the f5 square. Uh, Magnus plays rook e6, trying to break this blockade. Once again, open up the lines to get his pieces in. Rook a f8. Uh, Magnus simply captures on f6 and plays bishop a2 check. After king f8, queen d3. And you see Magnus uh, eyeing some squares to, to invade here. 
Uh, knight e5 is Kovalev's choice, simply queen e4. Rook d6, queen b4 pins this rook. And after king e7, uh, there are some tactics here that Magnus, is, that Magnus use, uses to uh, simply win the game. f6 check is attempting to distract the, queen, the king so we can capture this rook. The king comes to d7 instead. And now rook e1 is a very nasty move uh, from Magnus Carlsen, uh, attacking this knight. And if the knight were to move, there is rook e7 check to look out for. And if this knight were to come to a square like c6, simply a move like queen g4 check and, and f7 is going to be more than enough with uh, queening to follow. Uh, or rook e8 mate. A lot of, lot of ways to win for Magnus. So rook e1, uh, black went ahead and captured this pawn, which is probably the best try defending this knight. But queen d4 check is a simple fork, and the game soon came to a conclusion with uh, black resigning in, in this position. So once again, it's the same idea as in the first game on a little bit of a, a different uh, square. In the first game, we saw Caruana opening up the H file to his advantage. In this game, Magnus opened up actually quite a few lines, we'll say. We, he opened up this diagonal for his bishop and queen, as well as the E file for his rook. And these two files, this file and this diagonal together, are, are what he used to gain activity for his pieces. Um, any questions about, about this one? We went through this one a little bit faster. No questions? All right, so I'll just jump back to, to this move here, uh, just for a little recap. Uh, once again, black should have played g6 here. And while g6 might look to be a more weakening move at first, because this pawn on g7 does a very nice job of protecting h6, and from g6, dark squares start to look a little bit weaker. So you might think, well, f5 gives up these squares, but these squares are, are not so easily attacked. This is kind of the, the trap of thinking y you can fall into when deciding between moves like f5 and g6. But a huge downside to f5 is when you move upon two squares, it becomes a much better hook for your opponent's pieces. And so moves like e4 and g4 become very, very hard to stop. And uh, this is really an idea to look for whenever your opponent advances a pawn, especially in front of his king, uh, to this, this fifth rank, we'll say. Uh, with that in mind, that about does it for Carlson's game. For game number three of the night, I wanted to look at Daniel uh, Dubov against Vladislav uh, Artem Artemiev, and we'll see how hooks came into play in this opening as well. We have e4, c6, d4, d5. E5, bishop f5, it's just a Karo Khan advance. h4, h5, this is very topical these days. Players love playing this h4 move, forcing h5 early from black, creating some weaknesses. Um, and I'll, I'll see if you guys can guess uh, wh where's the hook. Already, there's a hook somewhere to, to look for. It's not a trick question. Which one? Ah, so you're looking from the black point of view, which is uh, not, not a bad thing to look for. Uh, f6 is kind of you know, keeping in, in line with the idea of the hook. Uh, f6, when you're attacking a pawn that's so far advanced, though, this is more about um, just attacking the pawn itself, attacking the center itself, rather than trying so much to, to open files. Although f6 can often open the f file for, for black's pieces as well. So you're on the right track there. G5 as well, but in this case, white has more central space, so he's better equipped to handle with an opening up of the king's side. So with that in mind, where's the hook for white, uh, I'll say? C4. Ah, OK. So yes, c4. But the move I'm looking for is actually this, this h pawn. Uh, way down the road, we'll see that this h pawn being forced to h5 actually becomes relevant. So. This move, g4, is something to look out for. And this is a point I wanted to make about, about hooks uh, quite early on in this game. Because from a distance, you don't really see h5 ever. You don't see like g4 being a problem here, right? The square is well defended. Even knight h6 can defend this g4 square again. You don't really see it being a problem from, from this position. But the fact is, once you put this pawn here, that's always going to be a threat for white. It's always going to be something you have to keep track of. 
And we'll see that maybe eventually uh, black loses sight of this and, and g4 becomes very relevant. Uh, with that in mind, though, you did mention c4, which is a very relevant hook in this position as well. You're trying to open up the, the center as quickly as possible um, at the expense of leaving your pieces undeveloped for a little bit longer. Black continues with this move e6. We see knight c3. Black develops with bishop e7. I don't believe this is actually the most common way of playing. Uh, usually you see something like knight e7 or knight d7, although I believe there was already a very, very nasty game played earlier in this tournament where I'm not sure if it was Artemiev as black, but uh, someone got crushed by Ferruja uh, in, in this line with knight e7. So perhaps looking for a change of pace, he plays the sideline bishop e7 here. White simply continues with c takes d5 and c takes d5. And so in this case, uh, we'll, we'll call it a hook on d5. The hook was used to open up this, this c file. But it's not quite the game changer that, that the opening of the e file on the diagonal was, was last game. Uh, white continues very naturally with bishop d3. Bishop takes d3, queen takes d3. White is getting developed. We see knight c6, knight f3, knight h6. Um, you can imagine maybe black could capture this pawn, but opening up this h file usually isn't in, a, in black's best interest. Uh, so instead we see knight c6, and now after knight f3 this, this pawn is defended. Knight h6, and white actually makes the decision to capture this knight, uh, giving away, uh, or taking away black's castling rights, and forcing this rook to a slightly unnatural square. Rook c1, king f8, because castling is illegal, uh, g3, defends this pawn forever. We see g6, uh, giving this king a square to come to. Uh, both sides nearing the end of their development. We see castles and king g7, and now knight a4 and rook h8. So both players have kind of gotten developed, and this is kind of the main position we'll, we'll see ourselves in here. So this is a, a pretty typical Karo Khan type type of structure. And uh, I wanted to ask you guys if, if you could find uh, what are some natural ideas for, for both sides here? Where is the play really going to be directed? Where do you think? No ideas? Yeah, there's, there's no real way to improve this, this minor piece in particular. Uh, it is doing a really good job, though, on e7. It's guarding both of these advancing squares for, for the knights. So it is serving an important purpose on e7. Um, the pieces that can really be improved here, uh, well, for one, white's already trying to improve this knight. And for two, it's, it's these major pieces, right? So with that in mind, where do these major pieces belong in this position? Yeah, there's only one open file for the moment. It's the C file. And so black should be trying to contest the C file. Meanwhile, white's trying to improve this knight. And he'll look to uh, kind of dominate the C file before black has a chance to get there. And, and we'll see how both players go about this. First of all, knight C5. This bishop captures. And like we said, this bishop was actually serving an important purpose. So while white spent some time getting this knight to c5, now that this bishop is missing, it gives this knight a little bit more opportunity to improve itself as well. So both players simply trying to improve their pieces. And for black, that really means getting these rooks to the c file. For white, that might mean trying to do something on the king's side, while also kind of playing this, this dangerous game where you don't let black get the c file, and you try to advance on the king's side, but really you're keeping an eye on the c-file. So it, it's difficult to play these positions with white. And with black, I, I think it's a little bit simpler. You really just need to get on the c-file, put some pressure here, and that's how you can find enough counterplay. So queen d7 is black's choice, a very natural move, preparing to bring a rook here. We see rook f to c1, and simply rook h to c8. And now after queen c3, uh, let me double check here. 
Uh, yeah, what do you guys think the best move is for for black? What could the best move be? Keeping in mind what we were talking about. Any ideas? What moves come to mind? Yeah, Black would actually love to play b6, but of course he doesn't quite have enough uh, support for this knight here. Yeah, f6 would be a, a pretty substantial mistake. You don't want things to open up on this side of the board. You want to focus the attention on this C file. So with that in mind, uh, the best move for black is to actually play this move 97. Just already accepting some, some trades along this file and trying to simplify things a little bit. And the reasoning for that is that white is always going to have a slight edge in terms of things opening up on the king side. Things open up on the king side, white's edge is going to be this strong pawn on e5. This pawn's going to create a lot of threats around this king with its control over f6 and its ability to kind of keep this knight from supporting the king side too, too, too much. And so because there's this nagging threat of things eventually opening on the king side, uh, black would love to take off some of these major pieces before uh, things get nasty. So a move like 97 is actually really important. Um, probably the reason uh, he shied away from this is this move rook c7. But in actuality, this position I don't think is too bad for, uh, for black at all. This queen does get to this annoying uh, c7 square. But uh, after a move like knight f5, for example, uh, the black pieces are starting to coordinate again. And you can imagine that while black is kind of conceded a little bit on the C file. His pieces are now a little bit more free to, to get active. Instead, we see the move A5, which I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, by pushing this pawn forward, you are creating kind of a weakness, right? This is something you're going to have to keep an eye on now, kind of for the rest of the game. So we see A3 from white, trying to keep this knight out of the B4 square, one of the advantages of A5. And now A4 from black. And this is kind of black trying to uh, attempt to create some winning chances, I think. He's, he's taking some space on the queen's side at some risk, which isn't a, a horrible idea. Now this knight comes to e1, hoping to reroute itself, and we'll see where to in just a moment. And now is kind of black's uh, final chance here. Once again, this move knight e7 is what should have been played. And if the move rook c7 were to be played now, uh, even this move queen d8 could be played, uh, really keeping all chances of white getting to this, uh, this annoying seventh rank, um, kind of uh, negating those by keeping this pin along the, the C file. Instead though, black did something very, very strange, and that was try to repeat moves. He played queen e7, and after this knight comes back to f3, queen d7, giving white the chance to kind of improve his position some more. And white does so with the move king g2. And now rook c7. Uh, black is attempting to make some progress, but we see queen c2 from white, aiming a little bit at these squares on the king's side. Now queen d8. And this queen actually comes to d1. And who can spot what this queen on d1 is supporting? Indirectly for the moment, but very, very directly soon. He's supporting g4. That's right. And it's been 30-some moves, maybe. Uh, I haven't been keeping track. No, not quite. 20-some moves since h5 has been played. But the, the fact is, this g4 threat is, is never going away this game. 
So Black really didn't have time to sit back and, and do nothing in this position. He had to play a move like knight e7, which looks a little bit scary on, on the surface. But doing nothing isn't an option here for black, because white always has this hook on h5 to open up the position. And that's exactly how this game uh, continued here. We see the move rook d7 from black, the move knight g5 from white, the move rook a6 now. And everybody knows white's next move, right? I hope. What is it? It's g4. And this is kind of devastating, actually, for, uh, for the black position here. Um, due to some awkward maneuvering, black has actually totally vacated the C file. So all of white's pieces are available to come in to join this attack as, as quickly as possible with the opening up of this H file. And because of that, the move H takes G would be a pretty fatal mistake. You still have some time to bring this queen over to the king side. But it's, it's much too slow. So instead, after g4, uh, black tried queen h8 immediately. Uh, now, white wouldn't want to take this and give the black queen the opportunity to come back into the game. So instead, we see queen f3. And this rook comes to b6, trying to create some, some counterplay, but it's a little bit too late. Uh, and here, there was some very funny business involving the move rook a5. But uh, we don't need to go into all this. By you know, removing this, this knight, this rook can come in, and then some, some annoying things happen for black. But white played very, very simply. G takes h5. And now, uh, more relevant than the opening of the g file is the distraction of this queen. Uh, of course, black wouldn't want to capture back with the g pawn, because the rook could come to g1 very quickly, and that would be death for the king. So black is forced to capture back with the queen. And yes, it is nice to have this file be half open. But more importantly, this queen has been drawn away from the king. And now after queen f6 check and king g8, uh, once again, this move, rook a5. It's a little bit more clear now why it works. If knight takes, this is simply checkmate. Uh, but this comes into play, and white is invading along the back rank. And all is kind of falling apart. Black tries to give a check. After king f1, there's simply no more checks. The square is defended. Rook, or knight d8 was played. Rook a8, and black went ahead and resigned here. Just a quick note, you can't play the move rook a6, because rook takes a6 and b takes a6, and this knight falls. And it's all the same problems. Um, so this is the final position of the game, where, where black went ahead and resigned. And uh, I really like this game a lot for, uh, for Dubov here, because he really took his time. Uh, he let black kind of, kind of implode, right? Black got a little bit antsy, and he wasn't willing to accept this 97, uh, allowing the white pieces into the seventh rank, but keeping things under control. Instead, uh, Art Artemiev, or Artemiev, uh, excuse me, uh, simply didn't, didn't do enough. He didn't sense the urgency of the position, and Dubov sat back on this g4 idea until the placement of the black pieces was awkward enough for this opening up on the king's side to, to kind of win the game for him. Um, with that in mind, were there, were there any questions on, on this game in particular? Yeah? Yeah, why did uh, white reroute the knight to e1 and he put it back on f3? Did he see like, a forced reason for that? It kind of just released his mm -hmm. Yeah, so white was probably uh, deciding what to do here. Um, after knight e1, he might be uh, hinting at some f4 ideas. Uh, I'm not saying that f4 is a good move, but maybe he's, he's pretending he's threatening this. Uh, also probably on his mind was the move knight d3. And this knight could come to f4 with some sacrificial ideas, or it could come into to a square like c5 or a square like b4 to try and shake loose this knight or, or attack this pawn. But uh, the fact is, I think just the specifics of the position, this knight on d3 doesn't make too much of a difference here, actually. Because if we keep in mind, say move like queen d7, after knight b4, you're kind of forcing black to play the move that he should have been playing, which is knight e7. Um, and a move like knight f4, uh, while it is vaguely threatening, it, it does work well in tandem with a move like g4. Uh, I, I actually would have liked this maneuver, but I'm not sure. Something uh, clearly made uh, white shy away from this. Perhaps it was even this move g5 from black. I, I might be 
talking out of turn here, but g5 might have been might have been an idea for, for black if this knight strays too far away. Um, but yeah, sometimes you'll, you'll see these, these grandmasters repeat every now and then. Um, but yeah, king g2, and this maneuver of the queen back to d1 was, was very, very nice for white to, to open up this king's side. Uh, any other questions? OK. Uh, well, with that in mind, I think I'm going to, to call the lecture here. Just a, a quick review of everything we went over. The theme of today was, was hooks. And these, by the way, are, are all games from uh, the Tata Steel Masters tournament, which is still going on. And I would recommend you all check it out, because it's a very, very interesting tournament to follow. But uh, the theme of the lecture, of course, is hooks, which means you should always be careful and always get excited when you see a pawn pushed to the fifth rank like this. It creates this permanent idea of attacking this pawn to open up files. It's very, very powerful to open up these lines at the moment of your, your choosing. So with that in mind, thank you all for joining me for this week's Road to 2000. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you in the next episode.